Welcome back to A Dangerous Thing with Chip Chantry and James Heskey. Chip, what are you going to teach me today? James, I am here to teach you and the good people about the greatest invention in human history. It was in the 1860s, and a Frenchman reinvented the wheel, and he made it gigantic. Today, you're going to learn all about the penny farthing, that old-timey, goofy-looking bike with the giant front wheel. Now, <laughs> let's first of all take a look at the dumb name. The penny farthing got its name from the two British coins, the penny and the farthing, because one, the penny is bigger, and the tiny little quarter penny or the farthing is very tiny, so you put them together, big wheel, small wheel, like a penny and a farthing. The penny and the farthing, penny farthing was also known as the high wheel or the ordinary, and we'll get into those names a little bit later. Now, the penny farthing's heyday was in the 1870s and 1880s, and it was a symbol of high society of the Victorian era. You know, it was just the penny farthing. It was, it was just, it shouted the Victorian area, just like the phonograph or top hats or ornate architecture or typhoid, grave robbing, <laughs> and selling children. Now, before we get into the exact uh, history of the penny farthing, I want to talk about the bicycle itself, okay? I think we all know the two reasons that the first bicycle was invented. Say it with me, everybody. It was invented because of napoleon and a volcano that erupted in indonesia i knew that yes thanks for thanks for saying it though yeah so in the early 1800s there was a series of giant volcano eruptions most notably the 1850 eruption of mount tambora which is in now what is known as indonesia it's that was the largest eruption ever recorded by human beings so much ash was released into the air that it caused worldwide temperatures to drop bringing on 1816's Year Without a Summer, which, along with the Napoleonic Wars across Europe, caused major food shortages and uh, all, across the, all across Europe. It also caused a lot of animals to die off, and there was a giant horse shortage, okay? So in 1817, since there were very few horses around, a German man named Karl von Dres, I believe is how you pronounce it, invented the next best thing to a horse, the Lauf machine. The Lauf machine was also known as the dandy horse. Uh, the dandy horse, I should say, is also my favorite brunch spot in Cape May, New Jersey. Beautiful. Beautiful views. Now, the dandy horse was basically a two-wheeled wooden and metal framed bicycle with no pedals so you would just straddle it and use your feet flintstone style it's like you know how you have like nieces and nephews like a toddler has a tiny little bicycle where they like there's no pedals and they just use their feet yeah yeah glider it's a it's a grown-up version of that okay now the dandy horse was popular for a little bit but after a year or two the horse population bounced back and by the way horse population great band name right there like horse, po I would go see horse population. <laughs> so there was little need for the Lauf machine or the dandy horse anymore. So I'm going to fast forward now because over the next 40 years, some other types of velocipedes, great word that they use for bicycles uh, and tricycles, velocipedes, a, f a few different inventions came and went, including something called the bone shaker, which was a two-wheeler with a wrought iron frame, wooden wheels, and iron tires, and pedals that connected to the front wheel. But much like me after a romantic Saturday night date at Old Country Buffet, it was heavy, wobbly, and <coughs> uncomfortable to ride, hence the name <laughs> The Bone Shaker. Like, if you see somebody r riding this, it looked like it made it, – it, you, it looked like you were drunk and trying to wrestle a broken wheelbarrow. Like, that's what <laughs> – it doesn't look much like a, a successful bicycle. But then, James, along comes the penny farthing to save the day. A few years later, in 1868-1869, Eugène or Eugene Meyer of Paris, France, patents the wire spoke wheel. So now you have a much lighter wheel instead of like an iron or a wooden wheel. It's like those wire spokes like we know today. And he also invented the high wheel bike, you know, with the giant wheel, better known as the penny farthing. Okay. Now, the penny farthing you had a large, large front wheel that was up to five feet in diameter. So this wheel could be up to five feet tall. Uh, I mean, this is a gigantic wheel. The rider sat on a saddle on top of that front wheel and used pedals that were fixed to the front wheel 
to power it. So there wasn't any gears. It was just fixed directly to that axle of the front wheel, and that's how they powered it. The giant wheel made riding over bumps and cobblestones a lot smoother to ride rather than like a, a little wheel because you're not – every little bump and nook and cranny you're not worried about because you have a giant wheel. Plus, since the pedals were fixed to the axle of a large wheel, you could go a lot faster than other bikes because one rotation or revolution of your little pedals makes that giant wheel go around. It's a much smoother and faster ride. It was like 19th century Lexapro is what we're talking about. <laughs> now, a year or two later, in 1870, James Starley of England made some improvements to the penny farthing by giving it solid rubber tires and a hollow steel frame to make it a lot lighter. So now it's even smoother and lighter to ride. In the 1870s, the penny farthing made its way to the United States and became very popular because back in the 1800s, people in the United States exercised. Why? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the penny farthing actually also became a really big spectator sport. Penny farthing races, like around tracks, became a big thing. It was like the Formula One of their day because it was this like – very oh. beautiful sport with these like men riding these giant wheel bicycles around in a circle. Who and more dangerous. Bike. Yeah, and more dangerous. Oh, w- way more dangerous. We're going to get to that, James. Way more yes. dangerous. Now, the penny farthing cost about $140, which in 1870s was about six months' salary for your average working man. So that's like half a year you would have to pay for a penny farthing. So this bicycle was a symbol of wealth that not everyone could possess. It was like a Tesla that didn't catch fire. <laughs> also, it wasn't considered ladylike to ride these contraptions, so it was primarily young men riding the penny farthings. So it was expensive, and it caused young, wealthy men to get high and move really fast, so it was basically two-wheeled co- <laughs> Now, here's the best part, James. Riding penny farthings were actually very safe. I'm kidding. Penny farthings were incredibly dangerous, (laughs) and hundreds of these dudes were killed riding them. (laughs) How did they die, James? Let's break it down. You're sitting on a saddle on top of a five-foot front wheel of a bicycle that may or may not have brakes because brakes were sort of like an extra bonus item. Okay. Why not? Right. Yeah, of course. The pedals were fixed, so you couldn't just coast, so the pedals were always moving, and often what would happen is that this penny farthing would hit an object or a rut in the road, causing it to stop suddenly, (laughs) and the rider would fly over the front wheel with their legs trapped under the handlebars. And James, this was very appropriately called a header, because they would often fall headfirst to the ground over top of a five-foot thing, and actually higher because you're sitting up above it. So probably from like eight feet high, you're just taking a just a direct header into the ground. Although header is appropriate, I think there would have been much more fun names back in the 1870s and 1880s that they could have used for that. Instead of a header, they could call it like the Telegraph to Hell, or <laughs> the Alexander Slam Bell, you know, the All Over Twist, <laughs> Grover Cleveland's Revenge, Darwin's Exhibit A, or my favorite, going on a Lincoln hayride. (laughs) Now, for safety measures, some of the riders wore pith helmets. You know those, like, the the safari hats, little pith helmets? Which, technically speaking, is adorable. Another thing they would do for safety sometimes, if they were going fast downhill, what they would do is they would stick their legs over top of of the handlebars so their feet are flying out so if they did fly over and hit a rock they would at least go feet first over the wheel and just get very very hurt that's thinking that's that's thinking yeah throughout the 1870s and 1880s about a thousand people were killed taking (laughs) headers off of penny farthings so this is a thousand people dying that now by the way how funny would it be to be a coroner in the 1800s when you're dealing with tuberculosis, dysentery, black lung deaths, horrible illnesses. But every once in a while, you could write on the death report, cause of death, penny farthing. Like, that's 
that's a fun day at the Carners. Right yeah. There. Now, in the late 1880s, James Starley, the nephew of John Starley, the British guy who made the improvements to the penny farthing, his nephew invented the safety bicycle, which had smaller wheels, it had gears on the bike, and pneumatic tires, so like airs in the tires. The safety bicycle is pretty close to what modern bicycles look like today, and that really took the place of the penny farthing. But for that short, sweet time in the 1870s and 1880s, the penny farthing ruled and sent 1,000 wealthy trust fund babies to a hilarious demise. And that is why we salute the penny farthing, the greatest invention in human history.